uh, I'm very pleased to um, begin today's session with the Emerging Scientist Award. So this is one of our uh, premium slots in the conference. It's an award we've been running for, this will be the sixth year. So we've got the previous winners see, on, on the slide here. It's a competition that we run over the summer, um, highly competitive. It's really looking at rewarding people who are 15 years or less into their academic careers, who, who are really uh, showing a, a lot of promise and a lot of good work and good science. So the judging criteria uh, and the award is judged by a selection of the committee, plus a lot of our previous DDL uh, lecturers, so, so very senior people in inhalation science. And the award we judge in three categories. So one is the, the relevance of the work to respiratory drug delivery. We look at innovation. We look at scientific quality. We look at cogency and promise within the application. And we look at the impact of the work. And so this year, this year, Emerging Scientist 2022, I'm very pleased to say, is Andrew Martin. So Andrew is... <laughs> Absolutely. You'll get a second opportunity. <laughs> Andrew is the... Uh, an Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering and the Director of the Aerosol Research Laboratory of Alberta, which is at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, Canada. Andrew completed his PhD at the University of Alberta and has then had periods working in industrial research in France and the United States. And he's returned to Alberta to take up his ac academic appointment in 2014. I'll not describe his research because Andrew I'd like to welcome onto stage now, who will take us through uh, his research and demonstrate to you exactly why he is this year's very worthy winner. And I'd like you to all give a round of applause while I <laughs> present Andrew <laughs> with this year's award. That is Thank your award, Andrew. Thank you. All right, well, thanks, thanks so much, um, Ben, for the, the nice introduction. And um, gosh, it's such an honor to, to receive this award, and I'm, I'm just delighted to be here to, to be able to share some of the work um, that, that my group has done with you. Um, so, of course, I, I, I have the accolade today, and it's my name on the presentation, but I want to emphasize that the work I'll present is, is done by, by a, a large group of researchers, research staff, and, and students at the Aerosol Research Laboratory of Alberta, both past and present. And um, I certainly want to acknowledge uh, Warren Finley, who founded ARLA, or our research group, nearly 30 years ago, and who's remained a, a mentor to me for the, really the majority of my career, and uh, has, has remained, remained active in, in the work that, we're, that I'll be describing today as well. So let's talk about um, the presentation. So I'm really going to focus on, on two areas where um, I can highlight some recent work that our group has done. First on nasal drug delivery, um, and then on drug delivery to the lungs. And I'll summarize some of our work with, with predictive models of regional lung deposition before getting into um, description of a new filter-based method for, for estimating regional deposition in vitro. And so first, um, for, for nasal drug delivery, as, as you know in the audience, nasal products like, uh, like orally inhaled products are, are combination products with complex interaction between the formulation and, and the device. And so while most formulations are, are aqueous solutions or, or suspensions delivered as nasal sprays, there are propellant-based and powder-based products that have been developed and, and marketed. And so regardless of the, the delivery platform and whether local or systemic treatments are, are, are intended, regional deposition in the nasal airways is an important consideration um, for these products. 
And so a number of research groups over the years have, have explored nasal deposition in vitro using replicas of the, the nasal, nasal airway geometries like you see on the screen. And I'm showing here a schematic from, from our own study, um, which was conducted by John Chen, a former PhD and recent PhD graduate from our group that was published in 2020 in, in the International Journal of Pharmaceutics. So here we studied deposition in, um, in really a, a collection of, of, of nasal airways um, derived from CT scans of, of adults. And so these adults were, um, had no nasal pathology, so were essentially normal nasal airways. So in, in this study, each replica was sectioned into different regions so that after actuating um, a nasal spray product into the replica, the replica could be disassembled or opened up and the amount of drug deposited in each region could be assayed separately to get an idea of a quantified regional deposition pattern. Okay, and then also in a, in a setup like this, the amount of drug that penetrates through the geometry and reaches a filter can be readily evaluated and used as an estimate of any drug that might reach and penetrate to the lungs in vivo. Okay, so here are some, some results of that study where, where deposition in each region is, is plotted along the, the x-axis and the, the fraction of the, the total recovered dose um, is on the y-axis. And so this data is for, is for a single commercial nasal spray pump, nasal chrome, or a, a solution formula formulation delivering um, sodium chromalin or chromalin sodium. And this was done with a constant flow rate of 7.5 liters per minute drawn through the nasal replicas. And importantly, with the, the nasal, the tip of the nasal replica at a, a 60 degree angle of orientation with respect to the horizontal, so a relatively upright orientation um, of delivery. And each colored column here represents um, data obtained in a single replica geometry, so either a replica derived from an individual subject or a, uh, the one or the other nostril in, in a single subject replica. And so you can observe here there is, there is considerable variation between, between replica geometries, but some trends are clear. For example, there's, there's essentially zero deposition for this product in the olfactory and nasopharynx regions, and very little, um, less than 1% deposition on the filter for any of the replicas. And moreover, if um, I move to the next slide and change just the angle of orientation from that upright angle of 60 degrees to a flatter angle of 45 degrees, we can see a broad shifting of deposition from the anterior regions of the, the vestibule and valve on the, the left to the turbinates regions um, to the right of the slide. And this is consistent with what, what other research groups have found for, for traditional nasal spray products um, using similar in vitro methods. So this, this type of in vitro study, it's, it's valuable both in quantifying doses delivered to different anatomical regions of interest within the nasal cavity, but also in assessing the sensitivity of different um, device formulation and use factors on regional deposition. And so, for example, in this case, I showed you the, just a small change in orientation angle, shifting deposition towards anterior regions. Um, it is, however, labor intensive to conduct these studies over um, a broad series, in this case, of nine different geometries. Um, and if you wanted to kind of streamline things and choose a single realistic replica, then care must be taken to avoid selecting a single replica that, that, doesn't ha that happens to lie, for example, on the high or low side of regional deposition within a given area. So you'd like to have an estimate if you're using a single replica of sort of intermediate or average behavior. Okay, and that brings me to, to the development of the, the Alberta Idealized Nasal Airway. And so the goal in this work was to emulate or mimic average deposition in, in that larger set of realistic geometries over a large parameter space. And in doing that, we wanted to balance the, the geometry or the simplicity of the geometry in the idealized model to allow for robust and repeatable manufacture in, in metal. Okay, so um, the idealized geometry was first developed and refined by, um, in silico, so it, using computer, computational fluid dynamics by, by Milad Kiai during his PhD thesis in our group. And in that case, um, Milad optimized the geometry to match a very large set of in silico deposition over a wide range of parameters 
that was intended to, to simulate and mimic um, a wide space of um, deposition profiles that one might expect from nasal sprays. Okay, and then the validation work was done by John Chen during his PhD thesis, and that was done in vitro to compare deposition measured in the idealized geometry against deposition in realistic replicas, as well as um, with deposition that we could find and published in, in vivo gamma scintigraphy studies. And so that validation work was greatly aided um, by Copley Scientific, who did a wonderful job manufacturing the, the idealized geometry in metal in the, in the nice image you see on the slide here. So the, the commercial or the commercialized version of this geometry can be separated into a nasopharynx region, a turbinates region, an olfactory region, and then the, the vestibule, vestibule region representing the anterior part of the nose. Can I think the best way to summarize that work is just to sort of jump to the punchline and show you the comparison between in vitro results in the geometry and in vivo simulation. And so this, um, these results were recently presented in a, a publication in Farm Res um, by John Chen et al. It, um, just a few months ago. And so here the, each panel is showing a comparison um, between our in vitro measurements in the idealized nose and in vivo data in blue for um, a different nasal product. So we have nasal chrome on the left and then nasal necks and Q nasal from a study by Leach and colleagues um, that did the gamma scintigraphy for those products in 2015 on the right. Okay, and data is shown in the in vitro case again for two angles, a 45 degree and then a steeper 60 degree angle of orientation, and you're seeing that in the light gray and then the dark gray. Okay, and we can see, um, uh, just one more note I suppose, that the, the deposition here in the, in the idealized geometry uh, and the different regions of it are grouped together to match the way in which deposition was reported regionally in the in vivo studies. Okay, so we have uh, as good a possible comparison as we can make between the different regions defined in the in vivo studies and then used in the idealized geometry. But to summarize here, we can see quite good agreement between predictions in blue, again, for in vivo scintigraphy data and if the, um, the gray bars for the, the in vitro data, especially when we consider the, some of the, the slight differences in subjective uh, definitions of anterior and posterior spaces within the nose. So we were, we were happy with this data and, and took this as a validation that the idealized geometry is, is working as designed and able to capture in an average sense uh, regional deposition patterns in the nose for a number of different nasal spray products. In this case, both nasal sprays as well as Q-nasal, a propellant-based uh, nasal delivery system. Okay, so before I move on to, to our work in, in lung deposition, I wanted to make a few sort of comments and look into the future a little bit about our work with the, the idealized nose. And so first of all, um, it's my hope that, that nasal geometries like this um, become more widely used in the development of nasal products, because I do think they, they add valuable additional in vitro information that can be used to compare one product against another or to very early in development um, match, for example, a formulation to a device or just prove feasibility for, for novel drug products that we can get enough drug into the regions of interest in the nose to, to move forward. Um, and that's really the way that we use the, the idealized inlet in our own lab, working with a lot of collaborators, um, both early stage startup companies and, um, and other academics that have a, a promising idea for a new therapy that they'd like to explore delivered into the nose. Um, I've also highlighted on this slide at the bottom there, um, we're doing ongoing work to, to refine our in vitro methods um, with nasal geometries. In particular, I think the area of nasal powders is, is very interesting. With nasal powders, we have to be very careful about bounce and resuspension in our in vitro geometries that may or may not occur to the same extent in vivo. So certainly that's an area of ongoing work for us where we're looking at coding methods, using the, the nasal geometry with a downstream pre-separator and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I'd, I'd like to shift away from nasal deposition and to, to lung deposition or tar lung targeting. And in this case, the use of extrathoracic now mouth throat rather than nasal geometries is arguably much more common and, and better established. And a researcher has a number of validated mouth throat models to, to choose from. So there are the, the OPC or oropharyngeal consortium throats 
the, the set of throats developed at, at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the Alberta idealized throat that I'm showing uh, in the image on the screen that we use in our, in our group. And so here we're, I'm showing a, a simple test that can be performed, which is simply to position an absolute filter downstream from the mouth-throat geometry, and then to interpret the, any massive drug recovered from the filter as the, if you like, the in vitro lung dose or an estimate of lung dose that would occur in vivo. And this is nice with just a filter downstream of the mouth-throat geometry because we can, we can do this setup with constant flows or we can mimic realistic inhalation maneuvers through the mouth-throat and the inhaler using a lung simulator or a breathing machine. Okay, and this, um, this type of in vitro prediction tool um, for lung deposition is valuable, for example, in screening the influence of various factors on lung deposition, be they at the device level, the formulation level, or, or some estimate of how patients use the devices. And so, for example, I'm showing here some results of a study done by, by Connor Rizicki, in which uh, we compared three different commercial budesonide dry powder inhalers, evaluating the filter dose or the in vitro lung dose uh, at two different orientation angles. So a, a transverse angle that you see on the, the left upper uh, figure, which essentially points the, the mouthpiece towards the tongue, and a coaxial angle which points the inhaler um, aligned to the back of the throat. And in this study, we, we used um, unsteady, idealized inhalation maneuvers or, or breathing patterns that were defined um, following the methods defined by Del Delvadia and colleagues, um, which scale the peak inspiratory flow rate with decreasing device resistance. So each um, of these three inhalers that have different inherent device resistance was assessed or studied with a different inhalation flow rate that was picked to give an estimate of what patients on average do or are expected to do when they use these inhalers. Okay, and so we can see then with this type of study, we're able then, of course, to quantify and look at similarities or differences between the regional lung dose between the three different dry powder inhalers delivering the same, same nominal dose of budesonide in this case. But moreover, we're able to look between the light and the dark gray curves at, at influence or lack of influence in this case of, of orientation angle on the amount of drug estimated to get to the lungs. So for one of the inhalers, we had a significant difference um, for the, the easy inhaler in mouth throat deposition and hence filter deposition with the orientation angle, whereas the other two inhalers were unaffected in this, in this particular study. Okay, so well, well that relatively simple test um, provides an estimate of total lung dose, as we've heard already in, in the earlier presentations in the conference, in many cases, we, we might wanna go a step further and estimate regional lung deposition. Um, for example, in tracheobronchular conducting airways versus uh, the alveolar region. And this is more challenging um, with the most common approach being to, to measure size distributions and uh, using a casket impactor, and then either to simply infer regional deposition behavior, looking at um, stage groupings or fine particle fraction, or to feed the cascade impactor data into a lung deposition model and make a, a, a prediction, an analytical prediction of regional deposition fractions. And that latter approach requires extension of the in vitro methods I've just described to incorporate mouth-throat geometries. Okay, and this gets um, somewhat more complex if we want to use unsteady, realistic inhalation maneuvers through our devices and, and mouth throat geometries in the in vivo setup while including the cascade impactor to measure um, particle size distributions of the drug that's anticipated to reach the lung downstream from the, in this case, Alberta idealized throat. And so the, the approach that's, that's most commonly used is to use a mixing inlet. Let's see if I can get my, my laser pointer. Working, yeah, so use a mixing inlet downstream from the idealized throat. Initially, before um, any flow is drawn through the inhaler and the throat, we supply a matched supply flow of air matched to the vacuum flow through the, the cascade impactor. And then when your lung simulator or breathing machine starts to draw its breath, makeup air is drawn through the inhaler and the Alberta idealized throat to maintain the constant flow rate through the impactor. So in this way, we, we maintain a constant flow rate through the impactor so it keeps its, its careful calibration and we can use the data on the impactor to calculate a size distribution, but we're able to draw unsteady 
realistic inhalation maneuvers through the inhaler and through the, the upper airway geometry. Okay, and then it's at this point that we, we make a, a link or a bridge between our in vitro measurements and our in silico or mathematical computational models of, of regional deposition in the lungs. And so essentially we feed the size distribution measured by the cascade impactor, impactor which is interpreted as the size distribution of particles that are arriving at the trachea and entering the lung into a regional deposition model. In our group, we, we typically use the model that was originally developed by Warren uh, Finley and Kevin Stapleton back in the, the mid-1990s and has been revised and updated over the years since. But essentially, the, the model predicts um, deposition at the generational level within the, um, within the lungs in a 1D symmetric representative model of the, the branching airways of the, of the lungs. And so this is similar to the classic Bible A model, um, an image of which you see on the, on the right of the screen. And so then um, deposition may be reported as a function of generation number, or we can sum up those generations in different regions of interest, like the tracheobronchial airways or the, or the alveolar region. And again, just to, to show a brief example of what type of predictions are possible with, with this hybrid in vitro and silico modeling, so I've come back to the same, um, an extension of the same study with three, the three budesonide dry powder inhalers, where here rather than reporting total in vitro lung dose, we've extended the in vitro methods with the in silico modeling and made an estimate of regional lung deposition in first the bronchial airways on the left, the bronchiolar or small airways in the middle, and in the alve alveolar region in the right. Um, and so these are now presented on this particular slide as an absolute mass of budesonide, and this was for um, a study of five successive actuations, each of 200 micrograms nominal dose for the budesonide inhalers we studied. And so it's apparent here that there are, there are certainly differences in regional deposition, at least under the, the realistic real-world breathing conditions that we, we studied the inhalers. But um, perhaps it's notable that there's, there's more similarity than difference in the bronchiolar, bronchiolar airways or the small airways, where often it's said that um, inhaled corticosteroids like budesonide need to be targeted. Okay, so then um, moving even one step further, um, what I'm really, what I've become quite interested in recent years is linking regional deposition with what happens afterwards or the pharmacokinetics that define the exposure um, of the lungs and, and systemic exposure to drugs that are inhaled um, over time after the initial inhalation event. And so, um, of course, such estimates only, um, the estimates of deposition, they really represent the start of this story, and then we need to bring in models of um, essentially biopharmaceutics processes like dissolution, absorption, to, to look at what changes over time. And, um, when I look at, at publications in the literature, and, and certainly when we, we go to the posters in this conference, I think that it's, it's clear that similar, um, or many groups have come to sort of a similar conclusion that we can gain a lot of value by linking the in vitro and in silico assessment or estimate of regional deposition patterns to models of pharmacokinetics that, that follow. So I'll just, um, I'll present one slide to kind of show how we structure the models in our group and the flow of information. So first, when we think about a, a, the deposition model, the, the inputs coming into the top of the box there are the size distribution, the inhaled dose, the breathing pattern, and, and an airway geometry, right? Both um, the airway geometry, the mouth-throat geometry that we use in vitro, and then the assumed uh, branching airway geometry, the lengths and diameters of the, the airways in the lungs. And these mathematical models then, then output at the bottom of the box a, a regional deposition pattern, or in literal, literal terms, the, the mass of drug estimated to deposit in each generation of, of the lungs. In our group, we also then define an airway surface liquid model, which takes into uh, consideration an estimate of an individual's daily mucus production and tracheal clearance velocity and then is able to estimate the regional airway surface liquid volumes and the airway surface liquid velocities throughout the, the conducting airways or tracheobronchial airways. And so this is important for being able later on in pharmacokinetic modeling to estimate rates of mucociliary clearance, but also if we take then the absolute mass in each generation from the deposition model 
and marry that with the, the volume of airway surface liquid in the ASL model, then we can get an initial estimate of the concentration of drug that's initially, de initially deposited in different generations of the airways. And that becomes critical information when we add on a pharmacokinetic model to essentially interpret the results of the deposition model and the airway surface liquid model. So in the pharmacokinetic model, we then have to add um, estimates of release or dissolution rates of particles in the, um, in the airways. And so if it's a dissolution rate, we can model that as a, a Noyce-Whitney or Nertz-Brunner process where we're in some cases limited by the solubility of, of drug in the airway surface liquid, hence it's important to know the concentration of drug in the, in the airway surface liquid. We can define absorption rates for drugs um, leaving the lungs and going into systemic circulation. And then once you're in systemic circulation, dist uh, distribution and elim elimination rates from central body compartments. And so with all that additional information, then a pharmacokinetic model can, can predict finally local and systemic doses um, versus time for inhaled drugs. So that's obviously um, an important thing to predict, and, and these tools are, are powerful. We've done this in our group now for, for a handful of different drugs and mostly on industry-sponsored work, but in all the, the drug classes or the, the work that we've done, at least in our own group, we're really able to model these processes for well-established drugs where we have a, a literature, an archival literature to mine describing the pharmacokinetics um, for other, other routes of delivery other than inhalation, and at least one uh, pharmacokinetic study done for an inhalation formulation. And that allows us to, to fit our model deposition um, to pharmacokinetic data to define absorption rates. So what I'm interested in, but I don't have the answers yet, it's, it's sort of, I'll throw it out there for, for this conference and hopefully have discussions with you later, is, is how do we then move towards making prospective um, estimates of these important parameters, absorption, dissolution, that we can feed into these models to better interpret um, deposition modeling, but for drugs where we don't have already studies of inhalation pharmacokinetics. And so um, that leads me into the, the last sort of piece of the puzzle and, and bit of work that I'd like to describe to you today. And that's on an in vitro system to, to quantify but also to collect regional lung doses. And so here our, our motivation is really um, that apparatus, as I've described already, um, currently used uh, to test inhalers with realistic non-constant inhalation maneuvers and measure um, particle size distributions for use in deposition modeling. Those experimental setups are, they are complex and require a lot of instrumentation and careful attention to detail. And there are some upper limits imposed on the inhalation fluids that can be used in our breathing maneuvers um, by the, the maximum calibration flow rate through a, a cascade impactor. Moreover, when we interpret that data with in silico deposition models, those deposition models take, take years to develop and to validate as best as possible. And it does require expertise to parameterize, set up, and, and run those in silico simulations. So an, an, an alternative approach would be to develop as an instrument an aerosol classifier that essentially maps collected fractions of the, the aerosol dose directly to anatomical regions of interest um, within the lungs. And ideally, such a system would also collect regional deposition fractions in a, in a manner that facilitates further complementary in vitro studies of things like dissolution or even perhaps absorption rates to be able to estimate those parameters for use in these sort of holistic um, models that include pharmacokinetics. Okay, so that brings us to this concept of a, of a filter-based apparatus. And this is a project we've been working on um, in collaboration with Provera Scientific for, for a number of years now. And the key functionality in this case is to be able to capture both the, the extra thoracic dose using a, a mouth throat model, but then also the tracheal bronchial dose or the, the dose of drug that's expected to deposit in the small airways on a tracheal bronchial filter and the alveolar fraction on an absolute filter distal to the, the, the apparatus. And so um, some of the key um, integ integrated parts of this system were to include um, flow conditioning in the, the filter housing, 
charge neutralization, so we don't have, um, we found early on that we were having spurious effects of a high deposition on a tracheobronchial filter if we don't neutralize charge off some inhalers. And the tracheobronchial filter itself, which has to be designed to essentially mimic the curve, the filtration curve that we expect for the, the, the conducting airways. Okay, and we wanted this to be suitable for use with either realistic inhalation profiles or constant flow and to have relatively simple experimental requirements to set up and run a, and run a test. So I'll talk first about the, the tracheobronchial filter development. And so in order to, um, to identify candidate filter materials, we use CFD simulations first to predict the deposition efficiencies for multiple layer filters. And this led us to a design that consisted of, of two specialized layers of, of stainless steel mesh that are selected based on their wire diameter and their spacings. And on the right side of the slide, you can see um, scanning electron micrographs of each, each layer, where the scale bar here at the, the bottom left corner of each image is 100 microns. So the spacing here is on the order of 25, 30 micrometer spacing. And you can see and appreciate, I hope, the, the really organized, reproducible sort of geometry of these, these mesh stainless steel uh, layers. Okay, and then in order to validate the selection of mesh filter parameters that was based on simulations, we then conducted um, experiments to measure the, the filtration efficiency for the multiple layer, the two layer filter candidate. And this was done in the lab by sampling oil droplets in an exposure plenum through the filter and classifying the size distribution and concentration of aerosol upstream and downstream from the filter held in a filter car cartridge using an LP or an electrical low pressure impactor instrument. Again, we can see here um, four different plots, each at a different flow rate, moving from 15 liters to 28 liters per minute, 57 liters per minute, and then 80 liters per minute. A plot in the red of our measured filtration efficiencies over a series of particle aerodynamic diameters against um, curves that represent the tracheal bronchial deposition efficiency defined using various empirical and analytical models. Um, so those date to models proposed by, by Stahlhoff and et al. in 1989, which are the black and the blue curves, um, to the ICRP model. REGDEP here is the, the in-house regional deposition model that we use. And then we also looked at the MPPD, or the multiple path particle dosimetry model. Okay, and so you see um, a, a range or a target band of data between the predictions of these different empirical and analytical models of what tracheobronchial deposition should look like and how it should vary with aerodynamic diameter in, in a typical healthy um, adult airway. Okay, and we have quite good, I think you can also see quite good and appreciate good overlap with the red experimental deposition data for this filter, for this filter with the estimated curves from um, the models. Okay, the only time we really deviate a little bit is at the lowest flow rate, 15 liters per minute. And we felt that was acceptable given that the vast majority of inhalers that we're testing with this system are gonna be tested at, in, at inhalation flow rates well above that 15 liter per minute uh, mark. Okay, so we were quite satisfied with this and took this as validation that the, the selection of the layers of filter material was adequate to mimic the tracheobronchial efficiency in a normal human airway. Then that brings us to the, the filter housing. And here the, um, the final design is shown in a very nice rendered image prepared by Scott Tavernini, who's a very talented uh, research engineer who's been conducting this work in our lab. Um, and so some of the features of this filter housing are, are an annular shaped flow path, so aerosol enters from the, the upstream mouth throat geometry and then divides around this flow disruptor to uh, penetrate through towards the, trunk, to the tracheobronchial filter, which also has an annular shape. And so this design was important first and foremost to break up the laryngeal jet that's downstream from the mouth throat geometry. So if we just positioned our filter here directly downstream from the mouth throat, we would be getting time varying flow and non-constant velocities across the face of our filter such that the careful calibration we'd done of the filter would, would no longer hold. So it was very important to break up that flow and position our filter down where we have much lower, constant, and well-defined uniform velocity um, entering the, the filter, so the filter would act as designed. 
Okay, additionally, um, we have a voltage difference between the core of the annulus and the outer wall and a neutralizing section so that's, that's done by um, a corona discharge so that if we have very charged particles coming from some inhalers, the charge is neutralized so that we don't get essentially spurious or too high deposition as the charged particles come close to the wires of the, the mesh. Okay, so then um, nearing the end here, so then with the filter housing defined and our tracheobronchial filters um, selected, we compared then regional deposition estimates from the previous system I, I showed you with the next generation impactor position downstream from an Alberta idealized throat, coupled with our in silico model to the more streamlined predictions we could get from the, the dose collected on tracheobronchial and alveolar filters using this new filter-based approach. And this slide nicely summarizes two, two recent papers um, by Tavernini et al in which we compared the tracheobronchial and alveolar deposition fractions that were estimated by these two techniques. So you see here um, for a number of commercial dry powder inhalers on the left and PMBIs on the right, um, the fraction of deposition uh, for the NGI in silico modeling approach is in blue, where the fractions estimated from the filter-based approach or apparatus are in orange. And the darker boxes in each case, so here, 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 and here, are representing predictions, again, in blue for the, the NGI approach and in orange for the filters in the tracheobronchial region, whereas the lighter shades here, here, and here are giving you estimates from the two approaches of the alveolar deposition. Okay, and we're seeing over a range of different um, real-world commercial devices here, quite good agreement between the two methods. And um, the two methods are discriminating between different deposition patterns for different inhalers um, in, a, in a similar fashion. Okay, so um, we can see then that, for example, if we look at PMDIs, uh, a meter dose inhaler like QVAR, picked as an example, has quite high alveolar deposition relative to its tracheobronchial deposition, which is fairly, fairly well known for, for QVAR, whereas Ventolin and Asmonex have um, lower relative alveolar deposition compared to the tracheobronchial deposition estimated by either of these methods. Okay, so we take this as, again, it's, it's, it's good validation that our, our filter-based apparatus is performing as designed, and we're able to, to get a similar sort of discriminating power in, in predicting regional deposition with this purely in vitro approach than we have, that, that we have with our combined in vitro and silico approach using the cascade impactor data. So finally, I'll just end with some, some future perspectives. So regional deposition estimated uh, made using the filter-based um, assembly does compare well with estimates made using um, the NGI and in silico modeling. We do feel that the filter-based assembly reduces labor um, and allows direct in vitro collection of regional doses um, more rapidly than with the, the cascade impactor approach. And what I'm interested in now in sort of thinking and, and projecting some of our, our future research directions is how we, can, how we can use regional drug doses collected on these filters, not just to assay and quantify amounts on the filters, but to use those going forward in further in vitro measurements, for example, to use them in dissolution estimates and to try to get then um, estimates of dissolution at a regional level in the tracheobronchial airways versus for drug that reaches the alveolar region where surely we have a very different environment that the particles encounter in one region of the lung compared to the other, right? So in the tracheobronchial airways, particles, we can imagine them being sort of pulled down and immersed in a, in a layer of mucus, whereas in the alveolar region, we can imagine um, particles much larger than the thickness of a thin surfactant layer that they sit in. So surely there should be some difference in the, the kinetics and the mechanics of the dissolution and, and hence the absorption processes in these different lung regions. Okay, and just as, as sort of a final image to leave you with, this is showing, again, the nice orderly organized um, wires of our stainless steel filter, and this is the first layer of that filter after collection of five repeated actuations um, of, from the flow vent discus inhaler. So you can see a nice kind of even orderly um, collection of particles spread evenly over the, the wire mesh of, of that filter apparatus. So I'm going to conclude there. I'm a little bit over time, so thank you for, for indulging me that. 
Um, just want to acknowledge again um, colleagues at the University of Alberta that have contributed to, to the data that I've shown you. Um, uh, Copley Scientific for their collaboration in the, the development of the Alberta Idealized Nasal Inlet. Uh, Dino Farina and Proveris Scientific for their collaboration in the development of this, this filter-based apparatus. And then funding um, for the work or portions of the work that I've shown you from, from NSERC, the Canadian um, Engineer and Research Council, and from Proveris Scientific. So with that, I will say thank you and look forward to any questions that, that you have. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a, a, very, <clears throat> a very clear presentation, I think, which, which really shows the impressive body of work that you've, you've, been, um, you've been doing and, and it illustrates the depth and breadth of the research programs that you're leading. Uh, we are a little bit over time, so I don't see anyone with any questions, but you're here for the rest of the conference, so I'd encourage Absolutely. anyone who would like to um, ask any questions on this presentation uh, to, to meet with Andrew during the networking sessions that we have through the day and, and this evening as well. Okay, thank you again. Thanks very much. Thank you.